Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're now in to have a wonderful session with Dr. Patricia Hill Collins. Um, after last night, I don't think she needs any introduction because I think you all know who she is. I mean, really, who she is. So, Dr. Pat. Knowledge for knowledge's sake. And often, when you introduce other big ideas into that scholarship, particularly if you introduce ethics, and if you introduce questions of politics, those two things are considered to be anathema or negative or introducing bias into the scholarship. And I'm even add emotions. If you passionately care about your work, if you think your work has an ethical um, vision attached to it in some capacity. If you think your work should have some kind of political impact uh, on the power structures that be, somehow your work within mainstream institutions, and higher ed in particular, is seen as being devalued. But I would argue that scholarship in service to social justice is exactly that scholarship that fuses in a holistic fashion truth the search for truth, placing knowledge and, and really good ideas and good analysis in dialogue with ethical questions, with a political program that would get things done, and with a passionate stance toward the world where we care about what we do. We don't just do it to get a job. We don't just do it to pay the mortgage, although, by the way, these are good things, all right? I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying it's not just for those reasons. So when I think about the components of scholarship and in, in service to social justice, I think about four dimensions that uh, guide my work. And what I'd like to do today is talk about each of those a little bit and hopefully bring an example or two from my work uh, to those four points and then open the discussion up, see if anything, if it sparks any questions uh, from you or if you've in fact brought some questions to me that you would like to ask that aren't isn't necessarily connected to what I talk about today, okay? So, first thing I like to talk about is the purpose of scholarship. Why do it at all? You ever ask yourself that when you're actually doing all this work? Why am I doing this? It would be so easy to do the traditional stuff. It seems like it would. I like to think about um, some of my colleagues who do quantitative research, and they seem to think, and I actually, you know, I like numbers, and I was good math and all that, so I actually am not afraid of math. I'm not afraid of math phobic at all. And I look at some of this work and I say, these people are asking teeny tiny little derivative questions. And they're using techniques over and over again. And they got five articles from one database that they didn't even collect. And they don't even go back and look at the validity of the data that they're actually using for these 
arguments. And then they're proclaiming all kinds of truths about things like discrimination, residential housing discrimination, and changing the world. I mean, now I read this stuff and I say, oh, it's so easy to pop that stuff out because it's really formulaic to me. And a lot of it is quite dull. But I hit things that are just really interesting, that are quantitatively based and are really grounded. That stuff sings. All right. But for the most part, I think we're kind of in a rut with a lot of what I see in social science. So the whole notion of the purpose, ah, to get up and struggle with tough questions. Now, if you know what your tough questions are, you know you'll never answer them in your lifetime. And you have to commit to something that you will never finish. And for a lot of people, this is incredibly frustrating. Because this is a society of quick fixes and easy answers, and we want the answers today from yesterday, that happened yesterday, we want to finish it today. Undergraduates often are very discouraged when you tell them things like this, so I try not to tell them. I kind of hint and see if they can figure it out on their own. But the whole notion of your questions, my question for me early on was, what is racism, and what can we do about it? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. That's where I started. Now, the issue, however, is if you stay with your question and you push yourself to deliver on both parts of that question, what is racism and what can we do about it? That's a question that does tap into the ethics and the politics and the passion and the ideas in order to answer both of those questions. And they also lead down a path to a series of related questions. I would have been very happy if I could have stayed at age 16. Well, maybe I don't know about that part, but if I could have stayed 16 years old and just talked about racism all the time. But the path that I was on was a path that showed me that class analysis was going to be very, very significant in talking about race, both in the United States and globally. They were bundled together. They could not be reduced to one another. One was not the master category and the other the subordinate category. They somehow work together. And saying, okay, if I really want to do something about racism, I need a more sophisticated analysis of racism. That is, in fact, an intersectional analysis. Well, guess what? I wasn't the smartest person in the world. Lots of people have thought of this before me. When you start studying, you begin to see that. Following the path of why do this scholarship at all, the goal of changing it so it's better, so the world is better, and placing one's work in service to those big questions that are ethical, political, intellectual, and um, what I call emotional questions, questions of passion, a passion for justice. I believe Ida Wells Barnett referred to it once. So um, along with that, I would like to say one thing about this whole notion of purpose. This is sort of a, an aside thought that I just want to put in. Very often people mistake social inequality for social injustice. They're not the same thing to me. I think that there are social inequalities that are in fact just. Ooh, here's a radical thing to say. <laughs> so for example, let me give you the example of children. If you see a child in a family, and I'm, some of you may have been or may have had those little bad kids who just never listened, all right? And you say, do not touch that stove. And they want to touch that stove. You have to exert authority so they don't touch the stove. That is inequality. You are bigger than the kid. You have the authority, and you're making them do what you want them to do. That could be conceived of as domination. Now, that's inequality in ways that I said it's OK to have that kind of authority structure around age in that situation. However, if we abuse children, and we create an ideology that says, it's all right for us to beat our kids just because we're grown up and just because they're kids, that to me is social injustice. So beginning to get at the ethical questions about how we look at the inequalities that are in front of us, so we don't always assume we know what we're looking at. All right, so I just want to put that in there because the purpose of this scholarship to me is to address issues of social injustice, which can or cannot always mean inequality. We have to be really begin to be much more precise in thinking about this. And if I look at my work, the path of my work is just follow that all the way through. As I said, I started with racism, uh, my earlier papers, and then I started talking about racism and sexism because gender seemed to be part of racism and class analysis. And then all of a sudden, you know, gay lesbian folk jumped up and said, wait a minute. What about us? It's 
like, oh my goodness, there's this whole other system here called heterosexism that is quite central to all of these things I've been talking about that I could not see because of my privilege in that category. And then we go a little further, and, and I've got a student rolls in one day, she's in her wheelchair, and she says, you know what? We folk who are considered disabled, I don't like that term, she says, we're virtually invisible from the work that you're developing around. I started with racism, but after a while, I had to call it something else because it really no longer fit the category. This work that you say is scholarship and service and social justice, how can we develop work that is increasingly inclusive? If you look at the trajectory of my work, I've been working my way through systems of power pretty methodically for the last 20 years. I started with, because you have to study in order to be able to say something. You can't just stand up and blah, blah, all kind of out your neck. And I've been systematically studying, starting with racism and then looking at the literature on class and putting those in dialogue and reading the literature on gender and putting that in dialogue with race and class, moving on to sexuality, moving to nationalism, which is extremely important literature around questions of uh, citizenship, coming back, doubling back to work on ethnicity because ethnicity is not the same thing as race and racism. So, I mean, it's just been endless. I just want to say, when will it end? Well, because it's a social justice project, it will never end. Right. So, um, my books go from black feminist. The books are easier to talk about than all the shorter pieces that lead to the books. Starting from Black Feminist Thought, which really was my first signature book, which I wrote down the street in Langston Library in a little white room with no windows. All right. Uh, to the Marriott. How far you come? <laughs> <laughs> Three blocks. <laughs> all right, all right, tell the story. Uh, but anyhow, uh, to uh, my most recent book that you have today, another kind of public education, where I'm really writing in a different place. And I've since published a book since then called The Handbook of Race and Ethnic Studies, which I co-edited with my co-author who's in the UK. So anyhow. So that's one thing. First thing is purpose. The second thing I'd like to address is the whole theme of the intellectual orientation of the work itself. And I cannot stress too strongly with social justice scholarship the importance of talking about social context. Now, I am a sociologist. I believe in social context. Social justice as a concept makes no sense unless you're talking about social context. So what I've found over the last 30 years in this country is this drumbeat of attention to individualism has taken away our common sense around looking at social context. What that has meant for much of my work is I cannot assume that people understand structural analyses and I cannot assume that they understand history. So I have had to find a way to get social context into every single thing that I write without, without this kind of dreary tone of, well, we can't talk about anything today unless I tell you the history. In 1901, and then people go into some boring, droning on history or whatever, I've used a variety of strategies to get as much structural analysis and as much historical analysis in my work as soon as be possible. I'll use anything. In um, black sexual politics, for example, I wrote history backwards. If you look at that particular book, it starts with a quote, uh, it starts with Destiny's Child in the year 2000, the new millennium, and they're singing the song Bootylicious. You familiar with that song, Bootylicious? And then going backwards in time to, to Josephine Baker, who was doing the banana dance in France, all right, in terms of the sexualization of black women's bodies. And then going backwards a little further until I get back to Sarah Bartman, who's considered the hot uh, Venus, who in fact is the embodiment of black women's bodies and sexualities over time. Now I could have started that story back in, you know, back in the day, that kind of thing. But the kids were not interested in back in the day. I was really trying to write for a youth audience much more than I had in the past. So I started with the present, went backwards, and then came back to the present again. We don't always have to write history in a linear fashion. We don't, you know, we don't necessarily think about our own lives in a linear fashion. We live them in a linear way. But as we re-experience them, we, we experience them cyclically. We go back to certain events, we come back to the present, we go back further, we go back in and You know, that's how we actually use time. So to begin to think about using um, context, writing history differently, and incorporating structural material in my works was a challenge, but I got it in there. But it's tough when you're talking about things people don't want to hear about. All right, that's when 
makes it hard. Nobody wants to be, oh, we had a major social movement and now there's still racism. It's colorblind racism. Why doesn't Neil Collins just shut up about the stuff already? You know, I mean, come on, can't you acknowledge we got Barack Obama in the White House? This is a public racial society. What's wrong? You know, wanting something to be fixed is different than imagining it is fixed and believing that's the new reality. So I think increasingly those of us who do this kind of work can find ourselves being the Cassandra of the situation and sort of crying out about bad things are still going on. But along with that, when I say the intellectual orientation, this is what I've learned in the course of doing my work. I do not want to be the prophetess of doom, right? I do not want to be the lady who comes in who's always talking about oppression. Every time you see me, I'm saying, oppression is real. This is what I used to do to my students. They'd be so depressed by the end of the class. They would come in and begin, oh, that's the kind of we want, and everything that we want. And the last week, they said, we're still educated about whatever it is. But we're just so depressed. And that's how we get the course. This is not a good way to be. There are lots of different ways of talking about social context and sharing history and talking about really tough issues of horrible things that people do to one another that still retains an analysis where you see space for hope, where you see space for something different. That's where the politics and the ethics come in. What, get, what keeps people going on a daily basis? Why do mothers get up every day and deal with those bad kids? Because they love them. They love them too much not to do it. All right. So this whole notion of um, the intellectual orientation that we bring, um, I would like to uh, encourage anyone who's involved in scholarship and service to social justice. To, it's not a question, not, don't be pragmatic, just don't be gloomy. Because other than that, this just drives people away. Why would we want theories and analyses that tell us all they tell us is what's wrong? Now this is really hard to do. Right? And what I've tried to do in the last two books that I've written uh, from Black Power to Hip Hop, some of you may be familiar with, what I took on in that book was the adequacy of the theories that we have in dealing with racism and sexism. And I was kind of gloomy. I was giving people a hard time, which is why I think they weren't too happy with me all right, in, in some of the things I wrote in there. The Afrocentrists threatened to come to my house and do me in. Once they actually read the chapter that I wrote about the gender politics of Afrocentrism and civil religion, they were most upset. All right? <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I'm living. The feminists were kind of pissed off because they, their question was, white feminists, their question was, what can we do to all of it now? That's the drumby question that if you're in feminist scholarship, you're supposed to be worrying about all, right, all the time. That wasn't my question. I wasn't interested in that. I had a whole chapter about black women who were involved in community politics. And that was considered, oh, why would you write about that? That's so backwards. It's just identity politics. Don't you see how they're limiting themselves? Even when this is where people are doing profoundly important political work, all right, to shed, the, to shed light on that. So starting to ask the question about the adequacy of our theories, and then in um, another kind of public education, to really begin to sketch out a model for, um, that we can use a model for power, where we can talk about structural, disciplinary, cultural, and, and interpersonal domains of power that can be applied to racism, but that can also be applied to sexism and heterosexism and nationalism and a variety of other systems of power. But to do that by using examples from schools and to do that by having a chapter about anti-racist practice to really begin to develop and look for all the ways in which people can be proactive in settings, whatever those settings are, progressively from now on. So that's kind of what's coming down the road once I kind of get some other stuff out of the way. Third thing I'm going to mention really quickly, because you are graduate students, is the notion of what I call analytical strategies. Analytical strategies or methodology. Now, I would start with a pretty standard research method framework that says, what are your questions? You know that? What's your literature? What's the methodology you're going to use? Who's your audience? How are you going to disseminate your findings? Now, if you're working within a traditional model, a lot of that's already scripted for you. But if you're working within social justice and in, uh, scholarship and service to social justice, 
Those questions often will get you in trouble, every single one of them. Because your research question may be something that elite groups are not interested in studying. They'll say things like, why are you studying that? You'll never get a job if you do that. You'll never move up if you get do that. African American graduate students are routinely told all the time, don't study race, it'll pigeonhole you. You want to present yourself as a universal candidate, so study something um, else. Now, of course, this, this creates a very interesting situation, then who would be studying race? And what perspective would they be using when they study it? So, you know, there's just all kinds of things like that going on. What's considered relevant literature? Well, if you go to look at the literature and, and you're it's a, looking for questions that don't fit, the literature may not fit either. This is what I discovered working on black women's thought. I couldn't find anything in the library on black women. Because black women had been denied access to the library and to literacy. So I had to look for black women's intellectual tradition in other formats, poetry, fiction, um, music, drama, short essays, as opposed to academic articles that were verified in uh, sociological journals or social science journals. So that meant you've got to legitimate your own stuff as you go along, which of course is challenging. Uh, the methodology is another one. I think it's really important for us to work with people rather than to do scholarship on them. I just finished teaching a course called Public Sociology where I was working with undergraduates who were about ready to graduate. And the question I wanted them to think about was um, not to do sociology on people. Even if the methods are really quite good, right? the methods can be wonderful, but I didn't want them to come out with, I now have a paper about information about this oppressed group or that oppressed group or this oppressed group or this particular group. And who's the knowledge for? The knowledge isn't necessarily for the people you study. The knowledge is for somebody else. Quite frankly, the knowledge often can be commodified for your own career. So to begin to look at methodologies and say, what are all the ways we can work with the methodologies that we have that to make sure that the ideas that are in the product work? <clears throat> it's another kind of public education I produced in a really very, in a very different way. That was a good book. I gave four lectures, public lectures, in um, Boston. The pub, and it was to a group of graduate students, teachers, activists, even some high school students and some random folk. I don't even know who some of these people were. But they found their way to these lectures. And what the publisher did was um, record the lectures and give me a transcript so that I could write from what I said, but also from the conversations of what people who actually attended thought. It was a way of getting more people to the table. Because we thought, if you're writing a book about um, racism, race, schools, the media, and democratic possibilities. You want to get as many ideas as possible in there that are proactive. And you want to really reflect the thing, the experiences that people are actually having. That's a very different methodology than what um, academics do. They often will squirrel themselves away in their own departments. They'll go to meetings and only talk to 10 people who already agree with them, right? And then you get a certain kind of outcome when you do that, and we call it specialization. So uh, yeah, it's one way of working that creates certain kinds of knowledge that can be useful, but I consider that to be a narrow. When you test your knowledge in the crucible of dialogue, that is when you really know you're making sense. If you give the same talk to five different audiences, as I do often, you know, it's never the same talk, but as you really try and share the same ideas with very different groups of people, you get a totally different outcome, all right? So that would be one thing. And finally, I wanted to say a little something about the special role of intellectuals. Because I think anybody can do social justice scholarship. I really do. But I also think that what we each have to look for is our positionality on both sides <coughs> excuse me, of power and privilege. Many of us do social justice work because we understand social injustice as it's been directed at a particular group that we, of which we're a member. That's where we start. Social injustice against Latina, social injustice against um, gays and lesbians, social injustice against undocumented, da, da, da. we start with that. But we often get stuck there, so we become one no tunes. I think there's a special role for intellectuals who do this kind of work. We can learn from that particular position, but we can't get stuck in that position. But here's what often happens.
happens too, I would caution us. There will be costs attached to doing this kind of work. One does not do this work because of fame or fortune. I'm assuming you're all not trying to become Michael Eric Dyson. Yeah? All right? It's not enough space. So it's about 50,000 my Michael Eric Dyson. It's just one. But everybody wants to sort of have it all. You know, I'm going to do oppression studies, they're going to love me, I'm going to make a ton of money, and boy, it's going to be, I'll be on whatever, CNN, or whatever show you want to be on. You know, it doesn't work that way. I think many people in this room know that doing, placing one scholarship in service to social justice means making sacrifices. It means not getting a job that you were entitled to get, because when you're spending all the time writing up and doing this scholarship in service to social justice, you're not doing the kind of scholarship that is that recognized by uh, dominant institutions. There's a cost to pay. When I started working at the University of Cincinnati, three blocks away, I can't even begin to tell you how little money I made. It was so pitiful. It was embarrassing. I had to go back and fight with those people two or three times to get a salary increase over the next couple of years. I was so far behind what everybody else was making. I'll just share this little story because I love this little story. See, knowledge is power. When you work at a public institution, you can look up what people make. And I decided I was going to go to Langston Library and look up what people actually made. And I found 13 people who'd been promoted the year I had been promoted, who graduated when I graduated, who'd come through that system, and I looked at salary distributions. And lo and behold, I discovered I was second from the bottom. The only person who was lower than me was a Latino guy in, in English. And I thought, should I call him up and tell him or not? You know, like, who do you kind of black lady over at Afghan Studies trying to tell you? You can really get screwed, you know? first. All right. So I went to the dean and I said, you know, I know how this distribution looks. And it was quite a substantial difference in money. I said, I know how this distribution looks and you're probably saying, but it's all it's a difference in the field. You know, we pay more for engineers and we pay more for us. You know, and it's FM studies. That's why you're making so little. I said, well, I, I know how this, I, I know there are really good reasons for this, but I'm going to tell you how this looks. And the way this looks is really discriminatory. So I think the least you could do is give me a salary in the middle of this range. And don't you know the next day, I got a letter from the dean. We have discovered that we're going to give you a salary in the middle of the range. I mean, that's kind of thing. So, but people shouldn't really have to do that if situations are set up to be fair. Because they're not. This is the whole notion of looking at structural issues. So when I say, um, you know, the special role of intellectuals, I can certainly sit here and say, oh, this is a calling, this is a mission, we should all just really, you know, fight for others to be altruistic. But I think it's extremely important that we support ourselves while we're doing this and know how to know the value of our own time and our own intellect and make sure we are not ripped off by institutions or other people. And my books, um, that's kind of how I look at it now. When I started writing, I was so happy somebody would publish anything. I was just like, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I read those contracts like carefully because book contracts really do not make, give you money. The publishers really do make a considerable amount of money. And they own these ideas in perpetuity. They really take the lion's share of, of, of you know, the profits. So, um, that's what I would say about the special role of the intellectual. We've got to be, you know, intellectually and politically savvy. So I talked a little less about my work that I intended to, but hopefully this gives you a place to start in terms of some questions or some ideas or things that you would like to pursue further. You're going to have to yell, because I'm not going to pass this one on the mic all the Just stand up and yell. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hi there. Uh, David Holzberg, cohort seven, and thank you so much. One of the questions I have, we were talking about social justice and working within social justice, and I'm thinking, for those of us within the leadership program, um, I'm in the leadership program, my goal, my desire is to work within organizations, not large nonprofits, corporate settings, consulting in those places. So it's, in, in terms of what you're talking about, it's almost like going into the lion's den. But how, how would you, what advice would you give to somebody who's trying to affect your same agenda, but doing it in that type of setting? I think the issue is to be incredibly clear about what, you know, what you're committed to. 
And if you're committed to social justice, wherever you may be, the next issue is to really develop a critical analysis of the situation that you're in and what's possible and what's not. I often find that people think too small. The example that I just gave you, very often if you don't ask for something, you definitely don't get it. If you ask, you definitely don't get it. But if you ask, you may in fact get it. And it's surprising what you get if you actually ask. And if you know your own sources of power. I think a lot of it is analyzing what's possible for a particular organization. What can it do? And helping it do the best it can to be the best it can be. You'll often find that an organization will have a motto, an ethos, a plan, a goal, a self-identity. It might be a church, so it's got a religious ethical framework already. It might have a mission statement about how it's bringing science to the world. It might have a statement that's going to help the unfortunate and feed, you know, feed the hungry and put shoes on the, Whatever it is, there's usually some kind of a mission statement as to why that entity exists in the first place. And there's very often a huge gap between what that mission is and what is actually happening. So that's a place for moral suasion. That's one way of exerting leadership, is analyzing all those little slippages and then um, putting in sequence what seems to make sense first, to do first, second, third, fourth. The other thing, a second thing would be to think about one's own leadership capacity, what you have to work with, and get more. Get more. Just get more. <laughs> get more people, get more money, get more power, get more whatever it is. Redefine your position. I'm a big fan of redefining my position. You can have a title, but the, as you all know, in an organization, the same title can mean very, very different things. Different people have that same title and they have very different jobs attached to it. Uh, my example would be when I worked at Tufts University, my title was Director of the African American Center. Nobody knew what that was. Basically before me, what that meant was I was supposed to help black students adjust to the school. So I was supposed to sit there and say, you know, it's like a special student services kind of issue. Okay, now you know you all are downtrodden. This is the daughter of a doctor I'm saying this to, right? She's my dad is a physician, I'm not downtrodden, all right? But, all right. but you know you're downtrodden. <laughs> and what you're supposed to do is downtrodden to the leader. Is you're supposed to, you know, I thought to myself, oh, no, 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 we're not going this direction. We're going to take the same title and exert some leadership about helping the school be a better school for everybody. And we're going to use the situation of African-American students, and eventually we expanded that, uh, to help them do that. So we discovered that, for example, the African, and this information is powerful. I started using my position to ask for information, what I already had to get more. And what I found in that particular setting was that um, financial aid was a very, excuse me, performance was a really interesting issue in terms of the intro of science courses. We knew that our kids were getting killed in the intro of science courses. They were like leaving and then sort of not staying in science. But what we didn't realize was how many other kids were also leaving those science courses and why that was the case. So we got a program started on opportunities in science for everybody that helped our kids primarily, primarily but really helped the school do a better job. So by redefining the mission of that organization from being straight student services to kind of ombudsman, ombudsman and helping the institution think about its, um, basically its social justice uh, framework in all aspects. I showed up at everything. They could not get rid of me. I would just show up here, I'd show up there, I'd say faculty meetings, I was students, I was there, that kind of thing. So leadership is, to me, how hard you want to push. And the issue too is also knowing your own style. Because style can really help or hurt people. Now you gotta understand, I'm a smart black woman. Do you think I'm a smart black woman? Okay, I've been a smart black woman my whole life. And I'm smart enough to know that people are scared of smart black women. <laughs> they are. You come in there too smart, and it's just, you too smart. All right, that one. You know, whether it's you're on a date, you're too smart. Or, you know, or whether you're in a, you know, a, a meeting, oh, she's, she's too smart. We can't, we have to ignore her. And then, you know, white guy, right after he says the same thing, and everybody says, oh, that was so smart. You know, you just said it, that kind of thing. I mean, so there are all kinds of weighed strategies of, of sort of that. So I had to think early on, how am I being perceived and what is going to be my leadership style? When do I smile? And when do I not? 
the performance, the convincibility of the performance. Can you give a convincing performance that shifts from setting to setting? Because if people see you coming and they always know you're always the same way, we all we like to think that that's integrity. Yes, I'm integrity, I'm always the same way. Well, what that means is in some situations you're an asshole, and in others you're not. <laughs> so knowing how to do what's called that Gossman's performance of front stage, backstage, knowing that backstage you're still you, you're still committed to social justice, it's just a question of sometimes you're in a suit and sometimes you're in shorts. All right. It's all. It's not. You know, it's not. A, it's not an inauthentic performance. It's a performance that you really have to do to get things done. And that's often hard for undergraduates to hear as well. So when I think about leadership, you know, skills, style, learning your position, getting power and authority, a variety of things to me have to do with leadership. That's what I would say. Louder. Virgil Wood, consultant. I would like to ask you, um, retired professor William R. Jones, R. A. M. Uh, has a book of his signature book is called Is God White Racist? He has an analysis on racism that says that when you confront racism, you have shadow us. When you confront oppression, you got a real topic. I think it's hair splitting. That would be my initial reaction to that. Yeah, well, you know, here's what. It, see, I think that oppression, certainly oppression, is the deeper and the more robust concept. I don't doubt that at all. But to have to pick one or the other and then argue over which one is best is not where I'm going. So, can I finish? Can I finish now? Well, I'm sure he does, but I don't know what. So, can I tell you my analysis? Okay. I told you the smart black woman is all you think goes with this too, you know. <laughs> but let me make a point about this. This goes back to the point about social context. Because, you know, we're now in a global world. I mean, we need to develop a global frame on everything. This need of one's location, one's actual social location, and attaching it to a broader global frame. I see oppression as the broader global construct. And I see racism as a specific manifestation in a particular social environment. So to tell people they have to dispense with racism, I don't care about what he said. Can I say what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. I'm not debating him. I haven't read him. I'm just trying to make a point. We did have a conversation before this started, so we can actually yell at each other a little bit. So you all know this is friendly yelling. And I'm not really giving him that. All right, he's fine. All right, let's like, show that he's fine. All right. I, you know, we're totally similar. That's really what's going on here. And I love these kinds of conversations. Now, what I would say, I don't know what he said, so I can't speak to what he said. But if one were to argue that, he may not have argued the point I'm about ready to refute. We okay now? Okay, thank you. All right, I'm sure you want to man down in Florida and everything. All right, now, my point, though, is that I think what we need to do is develop um, analyses of specific social contexts because that is what involves people in social justice struggles. It is really hard to get people going on an everyday basis. Any of you do any organizing. If you come in talking about the global, you come in talking about the ideological, you come in talking about the concept of oppression, it's almost like you've got to build up to something like that to make those connections, to make those coalitional connections. So when I talked earlier about starting in race, but realizing in order to have an effective analysis of racism, I had to understand class. Now the people who start in class have to understand race in this country to have an effective analysis. I would say wherever we start, if we start in the Middle East, then we have to understand the politics of religion very differently than in other places. That would be a place to start. Or if we're looking at, a, a, let's say, a country that has a terrible record on gender, we might have to start with gender. That's who you really want to involve, people who care about that. And you eventually get to oppression. 
Because what you realize is all of this is really indivisible and constructs, the, these systems all construct each other. So I would agree definitely that oppression is the most robust construct. But I think the specificity, see what people want to do is they want to rush to the general universal concept without doing the hard work of going through the various local machinations. That is a conceptual flaw of mainstream scholarship that wants to come up with social theories that take away all the specific histories that created those theories. When you put those histories back in, those theories read quite differently. Yeah. Um, which Actually, let me more conversational. I'm feeling more confrontational. Oh. <laughs> conversation. It, it wasn't ever a confrontation. That's true. All right. Can you hear her? Yeah, yeah, stand up and yell. Stand up, get up. Come on, get up. You look, you look great. Get up. <laughs> you mentioned earlier about this number of one shifting, and I feel that I can't remember the two smart black women that wrote a book called Shifting that I can't remember the name right now. But this is why we have Google. <laughs> <laughs> and smartphones. Okay. The, the element, though, when I, when I read the book and reflect on my life, in regards to people of color, black people. And my question to you, as a smart black woman, two of them are smart black women, mm -hmm. I have problems with that because in that mode of shifting, it seems to be like a mind game. I have memories of my grandma, my mother, and if I want to start the phone calls with really the electric company, their voice would change and they just have a whole different demeanor as soon as we hang up. Didn't regret her again. And I find myself resisting the shifting mode. But at the same time, I'm trying to move forward. And it's like sometimes I just, ah, you know, and I don't know if any tips to try to take me. And I don't know who I am in the midst of evolving to be more of a smart black woman. This is what I would say in general. I think everyone's going to have to develop. What, I'm, what, I, what we're now calling these shifting skills. So let me just talk about it a little differently. We live in a world that's full of people who are so different from ourselves. But we're coming out of a world where we've been divided up in little boxes and segregated and gender segregated, racially segregated, nationally segregated communities. We're coming out of a history of segregation. So our skill sets are really local and specific to certain groups of people. Now some people who have been forced to leave their comfort space, whatever that comfort space is. And in black feminist thought, I write about black women domestic workers who were forced to leave their comfort space and go into the homes of white women who they work for and how they developed a skill set of translation um, that went with that. And I called it something called the outsider within perspective. More on that later if you're interested. Uh, but I think what I started off thinking about there with them is now much more of a general state of being for everybody. We need to be multilingual. We need to be able to understand the cultural capacities of other groups. And the hardest thing about that is not the other groups. It's us, which you just pointed out. The difficulties of making ourselves be finger on them, you see the different behaviors in people now. But you want the authentic you who's always the same in every setting. And I want to say, is that a good idea? Don't you, I mean, don't, aren't you different from setting to setting, but you're just not necessarily seeing that? Shouldn't we cultivate skills of difference in some settings? I'm the follower. I'm not always the leader. So let's say he's the leader. He gets his job. He's the leader there. And he decides he wants to be the leader everywhere. I'm the leader at home, I'm the leader in the community, I'm the leader in the movie theater, I'm the leader everywhere. That used to be called patriarchy. Or that used to be called, I mean, that used to be called something else, as opposed to term taking and sharing of power. So what I'm referring to here, I think I'm just kind of riffing off of your question, is the skill set that we require for um, doing this kind of work. This is a really important skill to be able to listen, travel, translate, 
and be uncomfortable. Oh, so you said it's not okay for me to do that. I feel like I'm using the product myself or selling, you know, selling out. Well, how would you know you're selling out? I mean, if you're committed to social justice, why would you be selling out? This is so much of it. would be forced in those uncomfortable situations to play the game, just like my grandmother and my mother. But no one's forcing you. You're choosing to play the game for your own agenda. That's the difference. They didn't have the choices we had. Oh, yeah. And if you see this, you would have so much fun because people will never assume you're thinking these things. <laughs> Pardon me, thank you. You know, I used to, I, I likened it to the, in the revolution with the British and the guerrillas, I believe this would be the revolutionaries, and the British were all lined up in red coats and in line, they had guns, and, like, and everybody with the guerrillas would just go, beep, 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 shooting them, saying, they're not playing fair, because they're not playing by the rules. You know, I mean, you got to think about this more like you're a guerrilla intellectual worker, all right? And, and this sort of, like, you wear what you need to wear in order to get the job done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the nature of contemporary warfare, too, by the way. All right. All right, so we'll go for the war metaphor, the sports metaphor. Well, I'm going to keep working until we get this metaphor right. Uh -huh. When we're not in the white world, we're in a you know, liberated space. 
right? Because it's a black space. But now, when you begin to think in a much more intersectional fashion about how systems of power actually work in spaces, you realize that those systems of power are everywhere all the time, but they express different saliency from one setting to the next, which is why you have to learn how to travel, by the way. One setting may be racial, much more racial than another, maybe more gender, another maybe more something else. All right, I'm not gonna let her go. It's not over, it's not over. <laughs> so, uh, the question of what would be a liberated free space and where would it be? You know, my mind went immediately, this is going to sound terrible in a group like this, but my mind went immediately to um, certain expressions of when you let yourself go and you completely yourself in a space where you are protected. And that might be either sex or a really, really good party and you're dancing. All right? Or perhaps a place where you can, where where you you feel whole, the mind, the body, the soul is that a liberated space? Now I'm not I'm not sticking with this argument, but I'm starting with this question now and saying I do not start with the impossibility of something. Therefore, I theorize it out of existence before I go look for it. I'm going to start with what are some possibilities? And let's wait a minute. That's not going to work. Why would it work? Why wouldn't it work? You see, um, things like, if you look at the work of Audre Lorde, who talks about the power of the erotic. All right? And I think she's arguing that as really a liberated space that has been, um, uh, or Foucault's work, on sort of penetrating the body. I'm going there. I'm not talking about just getting into the nasty and forget about the world. I'm really thinking something a little more sophisticated here. <laughs> I'm going to get myself in hot water here. I can see. <laughs> see, I'm not with that question was just going to get me going. But that's a really interesting question because I've written about safe spaces. I think you can create spaces that are, that are protective. They provide safety from certain dangers. But I don't necessarily think safe spaces are liberated spaces. So that's an interesting question that I will think about. And so they're getting relegated to no. They're not geographical at all. They basically are intellectual. They're spiritual spaces. All right. Um, you know, the whole notion of freedom, when you say liberation, I write about freedom. I'm thinking about this quite a bit. Because freedom is really a deep construct in Western cultures. Um, and all the ways in which people say, I have achieved freedom. A body can be enslaved, but the mind can be free. Well, can it really? Are you really free if your body is enslaved? I mean, it's sort of. You know, these are kind of these, these philosophical questions that I think are very important if you're trying to craft um, a social justice project that has political implications that work for people. Um, but I would like to think about that a little more, too. Can you get her up? No. I Drugs for boys as a, an act of um, feminism. 
right? That um, she, it's her body, she can do whatever she wants with it, and if she gives it to a boy in exchange for drugs, hey, that's that's what being feminist is about, right? And that's how we'll kind of conceiving of the appropriate arguments against that, or not even against the conversation of that. So I'm wondering about your ideas. I would want to separate that particular example from the broader issues, because I think a 17-year-old who's doing that and arguing that case, it's about way more than you know feminism and other things. No, absolutely. All right, so I think that's something else that is that is now that is coming out to an ideology that um, gives her a way to talk about this and kind of be rebellious. But I think something else is going on there because I, I can't imagine anybody willingly um, not see both sides of that kind of freedom. You know that kind of. Well, I totally agree, but I, you know, I was thinking when you were talking about shifting, which I do believe is an important skill. I mean, I think people could say in your Beyonce example, um, well, she was shifting. She, she knows how to play the game. She's a multi-millionaire taking off her clothes makes that work. Yeah, I actually argued that. I mean, if, I did make a case about it's her booty, she can do with it what she wants. However, <laughs> and it's true. However, not everybody has all that goes along with her to be able to do that. This 17-year-old is obviously not starving. She's not, you know, selling her body so she can eat dinner. Right. All right. And that's a totally, that's a totally different kind of situation. She's not out on the street, and, you know, in five weeks when she's 11, selling her body so she can do whatever. So I mean, you sort of have to say, wait a minute. This is where social context becomes really significant. The inability to see social structures and how different women are placed differently leads to these kinds of conclusions that all women are like me. And the choices I make are available to all women. Uh, the result is all women are in fact free and we're post-feminism. It is an amazingly narcissistic way of looking at the world that uh, I would not say this to her, this is what I'm saying to you. You know, it's an amazingly narcissistic way of looking at the world that is really the worldview of uh, kids who really are privileged. And just because privilege used to be white and male, now it's white and female, now it's black and male, now it's black and female, just because privilege doesn't match up with the way it used to look doesn't mean that we're not dealing with a discourse of privilege that um, some kids who can say all that because they can just look in their smartphones and take pictures of one another, et cetera. They're not worried about the electric bill or the fact that there are dead zones in Philadelphia where you can't even get a free Wi-Fi connection anywhere. Seriously, I mean, I, I, you know, I got this little Wi-Fi find where my new, my new iPod, I love it, I love it. sorry. And yeah, that's what I really do. And I'm looking for these, you know, these sort of free Wi-Fi zones. I couldn't find any. It was amazing to see a map with nothing on it except McDonald's, all right? That was the only place you could get free Wi-Fi. So, you know, so I mean, yeah, if you're living in a, I mean, it depends on what world you're living in. How can you argue it's a post-racial world if you were to go into some of these mega ghettos and ask yourself, what's going on here? This is post-racial, right? All we have to do is go to Washington, D.C. and go from the White House to Southeast Anacostia, which is a couple miles apart, and we would realize quite quickly that it is hardly post-racial unless you really adhere to some of these ideologies that say all oh, those kids in the Southeast are just stupid and Barack Obama is, we should all be like him. Well, maybe we should, but you know, we're not, all right? So the feminist one is harder for me because it's been harder for me to really try and convince people about their own oppression. I really don't spend much time doing that. I'm much more interested in working with people who know they are oppressed in some way. And the issue is to think about how to help them think about it, you see. Now one day, when, when this particular student or these students, something happens to them, often something will happen to them uh, that is sad, but it is really the catalyst that they need. It may be one event that is a life-changing event. And that's important. But there's some people, their whole lives have been life-changing events. To really take a look at the history of your life and see all the ways in which you didn't have opportunities. And you didn't have opportunities because your parents didn't have opportunities. And they didn't because their parents didn't have opportunities. And how that was pretty much hardwired into the bodies all of you were in and how the society ascribed uh, value to those particular bodies. That's what it's all about. And what's just and unjust about that? So I'm happy that you know, we've got a group of people who feel like they should pay absolutely no dues for the so-called personal freedoms that they have. But they have now become my problem and not my ally. 
and I feel really bad if I have to teach them. Now that sounds cold. This is why I need to not be in the classroom anymore. <laughs>
Because there was a lot of school and education in hip hop culture saying these kinds of things. Not only we particularly want to hear, let's give it some of the language, but that's what was actually in there. I mean, you hear a song about my school sucks, and you just say, you know, my teachers don't know anything, they don't want to keep me here, da da da. That's a very different discourse on school and study hard, and maybe you can get to your classroom someday. All right. So, um, I'm just tired of this stuff. I really feel that we need to start in another place and stop having the same conversations with the same people who are already getting their lion's share of attention. I don't want to do that anymore. But I won't clap for those of you who do that. This is terrible. I realize it's supposed to be a conversation, not a confrontation. <laughs> but yeah, it just makes me angry. You know, I'm passionate about this still. And I didn't realize I was. So that's really what you know. It's not you or your students. What is your thing? What is your comment about cult lines? This I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> this morning we were looking at, uh, at a piece by, by Perot, and um, what struck me in that discussion was how he looked at the collusion that took place between the press, the state, church, to, to uh, maintain this future to slave. Then fast forward a few years, we get the nine neglect. And now we have a uh, color line. It seems to me that America made a choice years ago, hundreds of years ago, they made a commitment to slavery and they keep changing the keep changing the public policy first of all and then whitewashing it with these Terms, um, and we're still fighting the same devil. The cult violence to me is no different than the nine and black, no different than um, the fugitive slave law. That, I mean, it's all the same, it's just a new label. See, starting with the whole social justice framework, I happen to think that what we have is a situation of social injustice. And I think we have a lot of people in this country who think we just have social inequality that is now justified. And that's the difference, all right? So we're both looking at social inequality, but we're evaluating it quite differently. And I would build my case on, on um, I just think, you know, I would start with kids. If I really felt we had a fair, meritocratic system to support every child from K to 18 or 16, wherever you want to cut that off, when we really take care of them, as happens in, in other countries, then we could claim that anything that you do as an adult, you're on your own. But we don't have that. And in fact, we have, I mean, those of you who work in school, and we have schools that are resegregated by um, race, ethnicity, and class. We have schools where, uh, my understanding is the next generation of kids in America who are supposed to support Social Security and our entitlement programs, if we don't pay for their education and give them health care and feed them, they will be incapable of doing that. We have a really short-sighted social policy around care of children, and a lot of that is directly tied to class and to race. It isn't just race. When you look at poor white kids in Appalachia, all right, you, you see some stuff like this movie, The Winter's Bone. You should see this if you haven't seen it. You know, you see things where you say, this is just so wrong. So the absence of an ethical debate, which is what I think we had, you know, we had decades back, an ethical debate about this is just going too far. It's wrong to treat children like this. And then they have these kinds of discussions that we're number one and we're going to go export democracy to the rest of the world and all that. I mean, they're the country are region that we live with. So why wouldn't we assume that colorblindness is, um, I mean, see, here's the thing. I, I would be fine if real colorblindness, and it was, it was socially just, there was, it, it, there was equality. I'd be really happy if we were at that spot that these students seem to think we're already there. I don't, I don't negate the goal. I just negate the fact that I think that's not the reality yet. So maybe that's a better way of coming at it now that I've calmed down a little bit. Yeah, I like that better. That's my, that's my answer to you, but I'm answering you now. All right. Uh, question, sir. Uh, Dr. Collins, could you comment on the mass incarceration of black and brown folk in this so-called colorblind area? A lot of people write about this, and I think I would agree with them. I mean, Angela Davis has written about this. Um, other folk, but what, this is what I would say. I 
think we're in a culture that turns people into commodities. You don't realize that you're being turned into a commodity. We all are, all right? This little girl is 17, it's cool to be a commodity, all right? But what happens with black and brown youth is because we don't educate them sufficiently often, um, and there really are no jobs if you're not educated. It's difficult to make a living unless you're kind of in the informal drug trade. We have to ask, how can they be valuable in this society? This is the argument I make, by the way, in a chapter of some black art. Which book is that? Another kind of public education. Forget my own books at this point. Mass incarceration um, is a way of profiting off the bodies of brown and black folk. Think about all the people who are employed. The telephone companies who can jack up rates. The people who supply uniforms, food, clothing, all those little teeny times that don't have the industry, that now have a prison. All of that. And what you need in a situation like that is you need an endless supply of people coming through to keep those businesses in motion. It's almost like the defense industry making all this weaponry that isn't actually used. You just have to always have the threat that maybe somebody may shoot a missile at you, so you keep doing it. Uh, so the goal is not to rehabilitate the people at all. All right, It's just to kind of keep those beds filled in the prison. Now that's a throwaway mentality around black and brown children in this country, and poor white children too who are also in there, and Native kids we need to also look at a bit more. Because this myth that the Native Americans were killed off in the 1800s, therefore there aren't any more, is simply inaccurate, right? So when we start thinking about these populations and how can they be valuable to this nation, I think their value often lies there. Now, there are lots of other ways, you know, there are also benefits. I'm going for economic argument first. You know, I didn't go for a psychological argument. It's some mean, nefarious person that hates black people. I'm not even going there. I'm looking, follow the money, all right? Follow the money is usually a pretty good way to look at a lot of things that happen when I say that class and race and gender are bundled together. This is an extremely good example of that. So that's what I would think about that. Um, and of course, then that raises the question of where are the points of intervention? If you know that's happening, if you know you have populations of folks coming out of these, these jails who are disenfranchised, the whole notion of felon disenfranchisement is something to really look at in terms of voter rights being taken away, all right, once you've had a felony. All of those kinds of things, it's all bundled together. And I love this language that's coming out, new slavery. You familiar with this work? I mean, some of it kind of talks about trafficking, that's where it's starting. All right, but the whole notion of slavery and new slavery and how it manifests itself through structures of legitimate government, which of course is slavery in the past as well, wasn't like some, you know, uh, illegal system, it's totally legal. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is in some ways feeling like fighting the same fight, but then the good news is that there were all these good people in the past who fought the good fight. So my assumption is that there are people today who are like that, and many of them are in this room. <laughs> You brought up a, a policy question in view of the 13th Amendment and the legal problems for the Constitution. Isn't that, it's in the Constitution, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Now, do you think they read that part of the Constitution in the House? No. Didn't they read the Constitution today, but they skipped over the three of us of a man part? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm becoming really jaded these days about a lot of things. It's all my time in Washington has done this to me. I have a question for you. It's something that we haven't covered here before. Um, and that is the Different, you know, walks of life. 
And one thing that does unify people is care of children. You can't argue that you want it great for you. You can, but I think a lot of people of color would not argue this. Um, to see the connections between what you're describing, so what a dream act was really interesting in terms of pushing the envelope on that. I think what you're describing is, well, for me that up. I don't know how many of you are aware of just really the hypocrisy of immigration laws in this country. This is a country that's based on, quote, based on immigrants after in, enslaving Africans and taking the land and they, you know, it's like there's a lot of contradiction in this American story. But the immigrant story is one that everyone holds up that we should all emulate. It's a story, you know, of, of people wanting, you know, I had to learn this in the sixth grade, you know, give us your tired before all that kind of stuff. Well, this is really a crock. Because a lot of the immigration laws have really been tied to labor needs. Right? And they come and they go, and they wax and they wane, depending on the labor needs of the country. All right? So but that's kind of the underbelly of this whole thing. What this articulates with, when you talk about the fences in Texas and all that, it's which kinds of immigrants. This is particularly a racialized immigrant population. So this is a really good example of race and class that is not talked about in either racial terms or in class terms. Right? It's talked about differently. So in some ways we don't have a language in public discourse yet to really find those coalitions that are needed to push this issue forward. And I think the coalitions are possible around kids because that pushes the envelope about the future of the country. I want to say more about this. I think the issue is that I have more than I want to say and I know how to say it in an organized way at this point. I think you made a really good point. So I'm living in Florida right now, and I continue to see that the visas and so forth and the green cards uh, for like white Cubans coming in here, highly educated Cubans who are white, seem to be given out like candy. But when you look at the poor who are trying to leave Cuba, no green cards, very few green cards being given out. So I think your point is very well taken. I thought about it, but you're right. We have immigrants coming in the country, but it's the white, educated, select, elite immigrants that are coming in, the poor, uneducated, the oppressed, those are being kept out. Yeah, and it doesn't always match up your standing color either, because there are immigrant populations who have high skills, who in the past would have been people of color who would have been greatly discriminated against. But color is a really good indicator. Right, looking at, um, as you see, Latinos and Mexicans, Guatemalans, looking at Haitians is another good example there. You have an earthquake, and the country won't take the people in. All right, now this is a fascinating uh, response on the part of, of this country. Oh, was then they all would come. Well, yeah, it's more than just the earthquake in terms of what's going on in that particular country. Uh, Cuba is an interesting history. I hadn't realized how um, many, many, many people of color who would be considered of African descent, Afro-Cuban, Cubans are, until you go to Cuba. Because then you go, like, that's who's still in Cuba. Right? <laughs> that was I to me. I'm going, wait a minute here. What's going on with this picture? Because that's another place where not having the racial language and um, trying to form a national identity that kind of takes it, that, that doesn't want to grapple with this racial past that really wants to move beyond the racial past and have a new kind of post-racial or um, multi-racial present or future can uh, become a problem. So all of this stuff is connected. It's like one big story in some interesting ways, but I don't think we're, you know, <laughs> this is an area where I do think leadership would make a big difference. And this is also an area where I think Latino leadership would make a huge difference. All right, the whole notion of who are going to be the people who get to the front of the line and say, listen, enough is enough. And I've seen more energy from Latino youth than I have from adults. When they were holding all those rallies, um, um, I think they were meeting rallies a couple of years back about immigration because people were afraid their grandma was going to get sent home, that kind of thing. So the youth really do seem to be politically in front of this issue in ways that are similar, in my mind, to how black kids were in front of the issues around um, inner city neighborhoods and all the things that were happening there. But they haven't yet gotten the traction of figuring out how to translate that into political power and political agenda. And I think perhaps that's something we might help them with. I have a question. Um, and I want to go back to the public process where I come from. Uh, in, in, in public school, now, this has to do with the the post uh, the post uh, thing that everyone is on. Uh, what year? 
your post cover line already? Whoa, whoa. whoa. all right, we're trying to keep up with you. Thank you. But in my state, in the state of Texas, um, we're being taught in the public school system, we're being taught what to teach, how to teach, when to teach it, that even preparing our, our uh, curriculums and lesson plans and so forth and so on, which gives credence to this new colorblind theory. And, you know, even they're taking things out of the textbooks that the next generation will have no idea of what it really is. I was just reading in the USA today, yesterday, the new publisher of Mark, Mark Twain, Puppet Eric Penn. Now, he's not favorite. Forget about the problem that was going on at the time. Puppet Finn, they had going on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I enjoyed just, you know, in that part of the dialogue, just reading. You know, I'm Tom Cabin is another a, a great book uh, that deals with that particular area. Time and space. So if you take out all the energy and put in political, you know, fuzz, warm fuzzies, then what good is the living? And, and then how do we attack that from a policy thing when, when we're told as teachers, this is what you have to do. If you don't like it, get out and find something else. This is the agenda. And, and because, you know, states have their rights and under the 10th Amendment that gives them total control autonomy over public school systems, you know, it's making it real hard for people, especially people of color, who want to uh, bring out social consciousness. I love the great state of Texas, because in a lot of ways, you are ground zero for a lot of these issues, because the Texas, uh, I believe it's textbook order, shapes textbooks in the rest of the country. So what you say is quite significant for everybody else beyond your particular community. And this whole notion of presenting the sanitized view or the skewed and sanitized view of American history is uh, very, very troubling. I don't believe in withholding information from students at all. I would agree with you completely. How can you learn to develop a critical consciousness if you are not exposed to a variety of ideas, many of which you may vehemently oppose? But you have to be exposed to them in order to, to do that. And the issue is finding a setting where that can happen. Now let me just back up, because what I hear in your comment, they're telling us what to do. We are powerless. Nobody's ever powerless in that situation. All right. First of all, I think you'd be a terrific member of the school board. Maybe not right away, but down the road, when the school board is adopting textbooks, if that is in fact your cause, you figure out a way to position yourself so you can exert leadership around that particular issue. I have this idea called specialized resistance. I mean, we, we analyze problems in their complexity and their totality, and we see how everything is connected. But we don't necessarily look at the niche that we're going to carve out for ourselves in terms of where our resistance is going to be. I specialize in intellectual activism. That's what I do. I write a lot. And I make sure it gets published. And I get up and I do it. That works for me. Or I give talks. That's my specialty. There are other things I, I could do, but I don't do. I don't know a whole lot about them. I'm not particularly good at them. But if you decide, you look at that situation in Texas and you say, here are all the things that really are driving me crazy, pick one and stick with it. Librarians are some of the bravest people I know. I don't know if any of you are librarians, but boy, they're frontline people around exactly what you're just talking about. You try and take something out of their library and they all these little mild man looking people, you think that all this stuff is just up in your face. You know, I mean, and they have a big association too. They have a huge Professional Association. So, I mean, there are groups that are involved in fighting these fights. Because we don't win every single battle doesn't mean the war is hopeless. So to present it that way leads us to the, you know, to the conclusion that we shouldn't fight at all, as opposed to looking for all the places in the great state of Texas where all kinds of fabulous things can happen. You are the frontline state one of the frontline states for brown black coalition work. I don't know if you're aware of that. In terms of schools, you're a frontline state in terms of your affirmative action and getting people into college. I don't know if you still have that program in Texas where the top percent was good, gets to go to, you know, all of that kind of stuff. A whole lot is going on in Texas. You're with the fences. So I mean, I'm, I, and I'm scared of Texas. So you need to just go back. Go, get down there and just you know, <laughs> get to work. <laughs> Very much. You sound just like a 
now won't wait. your take regarding corporate welfare. I'm a former single teen mother and had to use ABC to, to, to get by. 